This is my second time recording this video because the first time I didn't realize that all of my underwear were hung out to dry right behind my head. So not repeating that mistake. Now it's just my nightgown. Um, but I wanted to talk about my favorite and least favorite periods in fashion history because there are so many different and bizarre things that human beings have squeezed themselves into <laughs> over, over, uh, over the course of time. And some of those things have been decidedly less flattering than others. So I wanted to talk about uh, my favorites and least favorites. Uh, I'm gonna go in chronological order from beginning to end. Uh, and I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do favorites first and then least favorites. So I'm gonna go beginning to end the favorites and then backtrack in time and do beginning to end least favorites. So without further ado, let's start in the late 1500s uh, with this picture of Elizabeth I. This is the Ditchley portrait and it was painted in 1592. Um, I absolutely love this look. The uh, farthingale, which is, it's a, it's a, essentially an Elizabethan or a, or a 16th century hoop skirt. Um, it's what makes, it's what gives her hoop, or it's what gives her skirt this uh, cylindrical shape. Um, this is the French farthingale. There was also a Spanish farthingale, which had a much more cone shape, and that was fashionable uh, kind of from the 1530s to the 15... It kind of started going out in the 1580s and um, being replaced by the French farthingale. I am not a huge fan of the Spanish farthingale. This is going to be a kind of unpopular opinion, but early Tudor styles like uh, Henry VIII era I just feel kind of meh about them. Like, I don't dislike them, but I also don't particularly like them either. They're just meh. Um, but the French farthingale, it's also called a wheel farthingale or a drum farthingale. I think this looks so, so cool. And I think it actually looks really, really good too. Um, I, it's it's very unnatural, but I think it's a, it's a really, I just think that it's really, really flattering. and. Especially in this picture, the farthingale is so nicely balanced by her large ruff and by her uh, sleeves and hanging sleeves. Um, so I, um, yeah, I love this period in fashion history. In this portrait, I'm not sure who this is. She's wearing a crown, so that could also be Elizabeth I. I should know this, but I don't. Um, in this image you can also see that i mean in the last image too obviously but in this one you can see that as far as jewelry was concerned less was not more you could never have too much jewelry i i tried to count all of the ropes of pearls that this woman is wearing and i can't and she's also got all of these the the, the little jewels that are kind of on her on her stomacher the stomacher is the um triangular uh piece over her chest uh, those are called ouches, um, and those are all done with jewels, and then she's got bracelets on and a necklace on, and her hair is covered in pearls, and she's got this brooch on her sleeve. Uh, the more jewelry you could wear, the better. And in this, in this particular context, not in all contexts, but in this particular context, I just think it looks so amazing. Um, this is a picture of Anne of Denmark, and this is from the very early 1600s. Um, but uh, I think that Anne of Denmark was a really sharp dresser. I really, I really like most of the things that she's wearing in her in her portraits. She is wearing smaller sleeves in this, but she still has a large standing collar to um, kind of set off her absolutely spectacular farthingale. It was also sometimes called a verdingale, and I've even seen verdigado. I just think this looks so amazing. It's just so amazing, and oh, it's it's wonderful. Um, here we have another one. This is Elizabeth I, and uh, this one I like. Not only does she have the great farthingale and the um, the uh, big sleeves and the big ruff, but if you look at her forepart, which is the um, front of her skirt that's uh, embroidered. You can see that it's embroidered with monsters, which is 
I just think so cool. And it's very in keeping with Elizabeth I's uh, taste. She liked sort of like novelty things like that. She had a lot of jewelry shaped like monsters. Um, and she had one brooch, and this is a contemporary account, that was shaped like a hideous large black spider and looked to be natural and alive. Um, and indeed this brooch was so realistic that her courtiers often tried to like bat it off of her because they thought it was real. Um, this is another portrait. I don't think this one is Elizabeth I. I think this one is a countess. Um, but look at all of the embroidery on this dress. And if you look at her hanging sleeves, uh, it looks like they're made out of some starched gauze, which is just so amazing. I just, this is just so amazing, these, these styles. So this look was created by something called the French Farthingale, as I have uh, already mentioned. Now, as far as I can tell, there are only two contemporary images of what a French farthingale looked like. This one dates from the, I believe from the very early 1600s, and you can see there are these sort of like donut shaped things with these kind of, this sort of ribbing or cording around the outside to give it shape. Um, and I don't know why all of these people are monsters. Um, so that's that's one contemporary image. And then this is another one. And uh, this was um, labeled the Verdugado Francaise. Uh, and this one is a much, this shows it being much longer. Um, I'm not sure how this ruffle here on the top was made to stand out. Maybe it has boning in it or maybe it was highly starched. I, I feel like starch wouldn't be enough to hold up these incredibly heavy velvet skirts though. So it must have had some sort of support. Um, but these obviously look very different. So um, it's possible and likely that there were many, many different methods, many, many different ways of achieving the silhouette and that um, the French farthingale wasn't one specific thing, per se, as much as it was a generalized shape. Um, also from this time period, I love the ruffs. This is a picture of a Dutch woman from 1627, I believe, and the Dutch were, they were the ones who, who developed rough starching techniques. Um, it's because of Dutch starchers that ruffs um, permeated European fashion at this time period. Uh, so the rough, or the, the Dutch portraits tend to have the best ruffs. And look at this ruff, her, her, I don't know how her neck is big enough to fit that much ruff on it. And you can tell, look at her face, she knows that this ruff is, she knows that this is the ultimate ruff. Uh, and she's proud of it, you can tell on her face, she looks smug. Um, but it's just so amazing, I, this ruff is just so incredible. The, that are, that are closed in the middle, those are called, uh, cartwheel ruffs. And then this kind, um, which is open in front, is called an open front ruff. Um, surprise, surprise. And around the 1580s, ruffs started to get very big. And they eventually got so big that starch alone couldn't support them. So they needed to come up with something to hold the ruffs up. So what they came up with was a metal structure called a supportas and um, it supported the ruff. Uh, and if you look at this woman's support house, because you can see it underneath the ruff, this gold wire structure, you can see that it's got pearls and jewels hanging off of it, which is just amazing. So that is the first, <laughs> the first fashion era that I really, really, really like. I just think that it's absolutely incredible. Now, moving on to something that is pretty much the complete antithesis of the uh, exuberance of the Elizabethan styles is the 17th century middle-class clothing, the sort of puritanical, uh, pilgrim-esque style clothing. This picture is actually uh, Victorian, but it's quite, um, quite historically accurate. And I'm very happy that it, she's shown to be wearing brown because there's this circulating stereotype that the Puritans and the pilgrims wore black 
exclusively, except for their, their collars and their cuffs, and that is very much untrue. Many of the people in portraits are wearing black, but that's because black was incredibly expensive, and it's also very, very difficult to get a fabric to hold black dye. I know this from experience. So it was a sign of status to be wearing black. Also, um, black fades very quickly, so you'd have to replace it a lot. So it was actually a, a way of, of bragging to wear black. So that, that's why we get to have the idea that people of this time were wearing only black. But generally, uh, middle class, everyday people would have been wearing fabric that was earth colored, like this woman's brown uh, dress. And these bows, these little bows, were a thing that they could do if they were slightly more well off. And I love the Puritan collars, or Puritan collars, they were worn by, they were not only worn by Puritans, but these, these sort of, what we think of now as Puritan collars or pilgrim collars. I just think that they're so, so cool looking. I, I really, really like them. Um, here's another one. If you've seen um, the video on prior attire about dressing up a mid 17th century townswoman, you'll recognize this outfit again. Oh, and the hats. Um, the idea of the pilgrim hat with the buckle on it is uh, inaccurate. They did not wear hats with buckles. They did wear hats. You see she's wearing a hat that looks kind of like the stereotypical pilgrim hat, but she doesn't have a buckle on hers. Um, they did wear hats in this shape, just without buckles. Um, but they also wore this other kind of hat with a um, high domed crown, like this one. Um, these were actually more common. Um, this is a also a wonderful depiction of um, kind of 17th century middle class clothing, and this would have been worn in Europe and in the Americas. I really like this sort of, like I, 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 I love the extravagance and the exuberance of the Elizabethan styles, but I also really like this sort of um, plain, strict, puritanical, severe, simple look of this. I, I, my tastes run to the two extremes, very, very plain and also very over the top. Um, so this, this really plays to my love of, of plain clothing. Um, moving forward in time again to the 1690s and early 1700s, we've discussed this type of clothing before in the, uh, the favorite video. I like these dresses. They kind of remind me of 1880s styles because of the way the fabric is gathered, to, gathered towards the back. And also the torso is made longer. It's, it's, it's very, very long and narrow, and the waist is lower than it naturally is, which I think is a very flattering um, line. I thought that could just be me because I have a very short torso, so the idea of lengthening it at all seems nice. I think this is Queen Mary, but I'm not sure. But you see she's got the same silhouette, although I think that her um, mantua, the, the over the overdress, this would have been composed of two parts. There's the underskirt, which you see here is gold, and then there's the over part, which here is silver, and the over part is called a mantua. And it looks like her mantua isn't tied back, because they were oftentimes tied back to form that, that kind of drape. It looks like hers isn't tied back, but it's still the same silhouette. Or almost, it, it is capable of achieving the same silhouette. What do you think about this? The court mantua. Um, the fashions, the court fashions of the 1700s were absolutely insane, especially when you get to the 1760s and 70s. You have these these dresses with these, the there's a structure underneath this called a pannier, and there were essentially these baskets that women would tie around their hips to make their hips look really big. And at first glance, this could look similar to the Elizabethan farthingales, but uh, farthingales made your skirt stick out at the side, but also at the back and a little bit at the front. This only sticks out at the side, so if you were to turn this sideways, it would look like a normal silhouette, and then you turn it this way, and it's <laughs> this incredibly wide oblong on the bottom. It's sort of like a flounder, I think, where if you look at it one way, it's this very, very thin and narrow fish, and then if you look at it the other way, it's this incredibly wide and flat fish. Um, and I think that this has to be, here's another one, this has to be, I think, the most bizarre period in all of fashion history. Um, the Elizabethan styles were pretty bizarre, but 
I think that these these kind of Rococo Georgian pannier dresses are infinitely more bizarre. I, uh, but I also think that they look really, really cool. I, I really, really like them. Check this one, this, this red one. Uh, and this is red silk embroidered with gold and silver thread, because of course it is. Um, because why, if you're, if you're, if you're gonna go big, you might as well go all the way. Ah, big. That was an unintended pun. Um, but yeah, this is, this is, I think, the, the most bizarre period in all of fashion history. Um, and I'm torn because I, like, this is, this is one of the, this is an instance in which I know that this is not flattering. I know that this is objectively an ugly dress, but I also really like it. So yeah, tell me, tell me down below if you like this style. Um, because like, like I said, I know, here's another one in blue. Um, I know that this is objectively not flattering, <laughs> but I also, I also really like it. Um, so tell me, tell me down below if you can empathize with that. Uh, and now we're gonna jump a little bit. 1880s, the bustle, the second bustle era. Um, I think that, again, this is incredible, I think this is incredibly flattering. Uh, but at the same time, I know that it is also incredibly bizarre. Um, I don't know, what do you, what do you guys think? It, uh, you know, there, there are differences between the 1880s and the 1870s, first and second bustle era, and I can talk about that a little bit later, but generally, in the 1870s, the bustle had a lot more volume and kind of sloped down, and in the 1880s, it, um was kind of just a shelf and it didn't, it hadn't gotten, it didn't really have any wideness to it. It was just a shelf sticking off the back. Here's another one. This is a photograph of an actual person. Um, and you'll notice too, a lot of the 1880s uh, bodices have a kind of rounded belly and that's because the spoon busk corset came into style and that kind of emphasized the belly which I think is quite cute. I just think that these are, are incredibly flattering, the 1880s styles. Uh, and now to move on to my, what is possibly my favorite decade in all of fashion history, the 1890s with the leg of mutton sleeves. I think that these look great. I absolutely love them. Um, this is a walking suit from hmm, maybe 1892 that's been um, staged at a museum. And I love when you can find pictures like this of museums that have um, set up the outfit with the hat and all of the accessories. The, you can see this woman has a chatelaine, um, which is just, I just love it when they, when they have the complete outfit. Cause it's cool to see the clothing, but when you see it with the hat and with the hair and with the walking stick and the shadow, when you see it with all of the accoutrements, it was half French accent, half American. All of the accoutrement, um, it just becomes so much more alive. Um, and I just, this, this is just so elegant. Um, I love this picture of this. First of all, this purple is a, this purple striped fabric is gorgeous. And I love, 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 love the leg of mutton sleeves. They're very imposing, um, aren't they? I feel like imposing is, is the perfect word for them. This is, I also love this color of green. Um, and I would, I want to see this on like a, I want to see this one staged like that walking suit was, this green one, because I feel like it would look really, really good with a hat and um, maybe a brooch and some gloves. I think that I, oh, it's just gorgeous. Um, here's another one, uh, mid 1890s, maybe 1895. 1896, um, this kind of blue-gray fabric and the ribbons, and again, the leg of mutton sleeves, and this sort of like the wide skirt. I like the the wide skirts of the mid-1890s. Um, I really like the wide skirts. I think the wide skirts and the big sleeves just provide such an elegant line. Next, to move on to the 19 aughts. This is also a very elegant time. 
I like some of the clothing at this time and not some of the other clothing. So the clothing with the incredibly severe pigeon front, I think is not so nice. I will have some pictures of that later. But um, the clothing with a more toned down pigeon front, I think is, is very attractive. This is another one in green again. Oh, such a beautiful color of green. Can you guess what my favorite color is? Um, oh, it's just so gorgeous. And I love the jacket. And I love the Edwardian um, flair for putting like little bits of soutache trim and buttons and decorative seams everywhere. Um, now, 1910s. 1910s were a very, very big time of transition. In 1910, S-Bend corsets were still being manufactured. Um, lacy petticoats and ruffly things and gigantic hats were still very much in fashion. In 1920, all of that was, was gone. Um, so the 1910s were a time of great and rapid transition. This played out differently for different people. So for the wealthy, their clothing would have changed a lot. For the less well-to-do in 1920, they probably looked not all that dissimilar from how they looked in 1910, because why would you bother updating your outfit every year when the styles changed significantly? And they did change quite significantly. So and I just think that it, this is, this is, we're back to the kind of simple and elegant of the uh, Edwardian taste for uh, putting things on everything, like the, the, as many frills as possible, was kind of going out of fashion in the 1910s. The more simple, streamlined silhouette eventually won out over the um, overdone, overstuffed silhouette. Um, so, I and I quite like that. I think that's that's very very nice. The uh, simple silhouette, and then. Moving on into sort of wartime, this is a, a picture of a, a like a walking suit from around 1916. I think this is just absolutely great. The skirts are getting shorter, they're about um, mid-shin length now, um, and fashion is much more utilitarian than it ever had been before. Skirts got fuller again, which I like, I prefer full skirts to narrow ones. So skirts got fuller again and fashion became more utilitarian, um, and I just, and also very streamlined and simple. This, uh, another one of those museum pieces that I absolutely love what they've done with it. Now they've done the, the necklace. I just think this looks great. So you've seen what I like and it's been about half an hour. That is a lot longer than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> We've done my favorites. Now let's do the least favorites. I'll edit the pair noises out. Okay. So. We are going to backtrack again to the 1630s. So in the 1630s, you get these, first of all, the sleeves, I think, were too big for the skirts. The skirts are getting narrower, but the sleeves are still too big and they don't really have anything to balance them out. But the main problem I have, oh, also the sloped shoulders, these like incredibly sloped shoulders were in style in the 1630s. And it's just kind of like this straight line from the top of the neck down to way below where the shoulder should be. And I just do not think that that's flattering at all. And then also the waist comes way up and I really, really, really don't like high raised waistlines. I like waistlines to be at or below their natural area, preferably at. Um, and this dress is not helped by that orange color. Um, here again, we have this incredibly raised waistline and also this very dare I say, ugly hairdo 
with the sort of random curls. Um, yeah, it's just it's just not good. It's just not good. I and uh but mostly it's the raised waistline. I I do not like raised waistlines. So you can see where this is going a little bit later. Um, this one isn't quite as bad as the other two, but no, I lied. This is just as bad because it's got this incredibly raised waistline and also her collar. She seems to have left her support us off and her collar is just kind of flopping back. Ugh, ugh I just don't like this. So we're going, going to skip the rest of the 17th century and right to the end of the 18th century because I don't heavily dislike any of the fashions from those periods. There are a few trends that I don't like, like there was a trend during the Restoration in England, so the 1660s, of painting women in more essentially silk bathrobes, as you can see here. Um, so I don't like those, but for the most part there's no overall style that I can think of that I find particularly offensive. So we are going to skip right to the late 17, early 1800s to the empire, the empire dresses. These are, these are hideous. I'm sorry, I know that this is a very, very popular era, but I don't like it for several reasons. The, the biggest reason being the incredibly raised waistline. I think that it is almost impossible, if not impossible, to make this look good. Um, second of all, it's just very, very feminine, and I tend not to like overly feminine clothing. Um, this, These three dresses, like you can see, they're gathered in the front, which makes you look pregnant. It's just, uh, and then, and, like, look at this one, this woman here on the right. That's just incredibly unflattering. Oh, I just do not like it. And then the way that the uh, breasts have to look is just, I think, also <laughs> kind of obscene, quite frankly. I, I'm just not a fan of these fashions. Um, yeah. So let's move, a, that was kind of 1790s to 1820s, and now let's move on to the 1830s, because you heard how I don't like raised waistlines, and I also don't like frilly, overly feminine stuff. Welcome to the 1830s, raised waistlines and frilly, overly feminine stuff galore. Look at this dress. It's just, there's so much going on. And this one, this one isn't so bad. This one is much more sober. But again, the race line, the waistline is high. The shoulders are way too low. It's just something about these silhouettes look unnatural. This is, I think, is this the same dress as from before? Hmm. Um, God, those shoulders are just, ugh. 1850s. I mentioned I don't like ruffled skirts. Uh, those were really, really popular in the 1850s. And again, they just, they're just, they're frilly and overly feminine. Here's one in blue. Um, and they just, they're just so impractical seeming. And the, the ruffles and the, they just, they, 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 this looks like something that a doll would wear. It, it just, it does not, it's impractical, it's impractical. Um, yeah, I also am not a huge fan of the pagoda sleeves, which are the, um, wide sleeves. 1860s, the waistline starts to creep up again, and the hoop skirt is not like a, like in the 1850s, I can say that the hoop skirt is a, is a flattering shape. Um, it's kind of like that, that nice bell shape. In the 1860s, there's much more emphasis on the back than there is on, than there was in the 1850s, and that leads to this kind of weird triangular shape um, that you see when you look at a dress head-on, and I'm really not a fan of that. Um, that was a ball gown. This is another ball gown, and it has that same kind of weird shape. Um, this is a day dress. This one doesn't have the pagoda sleeves. 1850s and 60s were also really big on the fringe. Like You can see this one has this fringe trim, which fringe irritates me. 
Um, yeah. Uh, this is another one. You can see, I just am not a fan of this, of the line of this dress. It's, it's, I mean, it's a lovely color of teal on the trim, but I'm not a fan of the, um, the general shape of this dress. This one is a photograph and it looks like her skirt is almost kind of engulfing her. Attack of the killer skirt. 1870s. Again, I'm not a huge fan because again, they're they're overly frilly for me and, and um, just not convenient. I, yeah, I, like I said, I don't like overly frilly things. I don't know how many more times I have to say that. This one, with these, oh, these three little puffs there. And I'm also, here's another one. This could be late 60s, early 70s. This little pocket here is for a parasol. And that, I think, is really cool. But the rest of the dress, I'm not a fan of. Like this, this, this weird, like, bump here at the back. And yeah, and just the 1870s were just over overly done, and they're they're very similar to the 1830s, I think, in that respect. That there was just so much frilliness and fussiness, and um, not flattering. Here are more 1870s dresses. This is late 70s, early 80s. This is the natural form era, which I really don't like. I think it's because I, I'm not a huge fan of narrow skirts, um, and the natural form era had some very, very, very narrow skirts. And again, they're just very over the top. Um, here's another one. And there's also oftentimes this weird, like the, the bodices just kind of end very sharply. Like if you look at this striped bodice here, it ends very sharply and then the skirt just kind of comes out from underneath and they don't look like they really go together. And that's something that happened a lot in the 18, in the, in the uh, natural form era. And then the uh, Edwardian era, because I've talked about how I really liked the 19 aughts, but I also, there are some fashions which I really don't like them. And some of those fashions are the overly frilly, overly feminine um, ones. I don't really like those. And also the ones, those ones tend to be the ones that have an excessive pigeon front. And I think that's really unattractive. Like you see this one or this one, I just think it's very unflattering. And then, Last but not least, the 1920s, I I said that I like a waist, I like a, a lower waist, which is true, but for that to happen, there needs to be waist. And that is not present in the 1920s. There is no waistline. And it's just very, very ugly, I think. This one, you see it kind of poofs out at the bottom. And that was inspired by the 18th century um, panniers. And this was thought to be a more feminine way of dressing. It still, in my opinion, looks absolutely terrible. In fact, I think this is almost, this is worse than the regular 1920s. Um, here's another one. I also really don't like the cloche hats. I think that they look sort of like snail shells. Um, and also the uh, 20s hairstyles, I think that it's, almost impossible for somebody to uh, pull off a, a genuine 1920s bob. If you can, then I tip my hat to you because I, it, 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 it's a very unflattering <laughs> hairstyle, in my opinion. So if you can make it work, then you're very skilled, far more skilled than I am. This picture I think is kind of famous of all of the women walking together. And that's a good place to leave it because this video is getting very long. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, um, please let me know and maybe I'll do one for men as well because that would be fun. I don't think I've really done anything with men's fashion. Oh no, I covered the top hat. Um, it'd still be fun to talk more about men's clothing a little bit, although I don't know very much about it. Um, please comment below, tell me your uh, most and least favorite um, periods in fashion history and don't be afraid to disagree with me. If you love the 1830s or you love the Regency era, 
tell me why and challenge me. Or uh, conversely, if you really dislike something that I like, challenge me and, um, you know, try to change my mind. Um, I always enjoy a good, healthy debate. Um, so, with that, I'm going to finish my pair and then I'm going to edit this video.